and go. All right, all set. First thing done, successfully. It wasn't always this way here, right? So um, thanks for being here. Uh, my name's Vinay, and uh, thanks for your talk earlier, Philip. That was really good. So what I do in a work context is um, my mission is to make Magento successful because I'm kind of heavily invested in it. And I do that by increasing developer happiness. And I do that by making developers successful and more effective. Right? And that's also the reason why I decided to work on the Magento certifications with Magento. Because I do think it has a big influence on the whole ecosystem. It gives developers a motivation to learn, and that raises the all-over quality and spreads knowledge. Right. So, quick poll to start with. Who here has sat in one or more Magento 1 exams? Oh, cool. Okay, maybe 70%. And who here has sat in one or more Developer 2, uh, Magento 2 exams, not Developer 2? <laughs> All right. Oh, wow. Okay. Maybe 10, 12 people. Not that many. Hopefully, I'll be able to change this a little bit. So um, this is the certification profile on the Magento page. There are quite a few badge collectors around in the Magento ecosystem. There are quite a few who have more than I have. Right? I'm um, not the most prolific one there. And to be honest, I had it a little easier because I was involved in writing quite a few of those exams. So <laughs> don't <laughs> Um, this little broken image icon on the left is the upcoming Magento 2 Developer Plus exam. It's not yet in the system, so the logo is still missing. But just saying, it's, <laughs> it's in there too. All right. So the only other certification I ever did was the LPI certification back in 2003. I did it kind of to, for myself. I wanted to know, you know, how do I match up? How do I stack up with the field? Can I do something? I'm self-taught. I didn't go to uni or anything. So uh, that was good. It gave me a lot of confidence to be able to pass this. But my dog took a lot of interest in it. And that's basically feeding that little card they gave us to the dog. Uh, she was quite interested in it. And uh, that's just to remind us, tech certifications have a rather short shelf life, right? So let's not take this too serious. It's, it's just a certification. But it's still kind of good to have it. And it can have a very positive impact. All right, so of the people here who took Magento 2 certifications, who also took a Magento 1 certification? Uh, okay, not everybody, interesting. So one thing that I heard quite often is people coming from Magento 1 moving to Magento 2 certifications, I would expect it to be the similar to the Magento 1 certifications, but turns out they're quite different. So with this talk, I want to talk, um, give, it a, you give you an idea of what to expect, right? So you can prepare well and don't get caught off guard. So how are they different? Well, some things were, are the same. Mainly, the questions were written by a community advisory board. And uh, each question is written to match an objective on an exam blueprint. So we have a certain set of exam topics to cover, and that's what the questions are written for. But the main difference was the time frame during which the certification was created and the review process. So with Magento 1, we had months of online meetings. And the authors were writing the questions individually. And then we had these online meetings for an hour, two hours, or three hours. And it just kept going on and on and on. And the reviewers really were nitpicking about, oh, but you could use this answer in this way, and then it would work. And it's not a distractor after all. So we really tried to make the answers and the question really airtight. With Magento 2, that was quite different. With Magento 2, it's one week, the whole group in one room, and get it done. And they worked quite well. So the result is with the Magento 1, a lot of the questions are rather contrived and memorization friendly. And in Magento 2, all the questions are scenario based, more real life, more natural. Even though if an option isn't really airtight, it's more like we as developers would talk about it every day. So I think it actually makes it easier to understand, even though it's less uh, theoretical. In Magento 1, there are a lot of questions about config XML paths and class names. And the reasoning for that at the time was, well, if I'm a developer and I've been writing Magento code for two years, I've written that 100 times. So it just kind of is memorization through repetition. 
after a certain amount of times, I know it. But that was before Magicento was released. So who remembers <coughs> Magicento? It was a game changer, right? We got auto completion and code generation. So this whole rationale of just learning stuff through repetition, mindless <laughs> repetition, it fell away. People still kind of memorized the stuff and were able to pass the Magento exams, which actually shows maybe the exam wasn't that good to start with, based that way. So in Magento 2, for the certifications, there are no questions about things we get IDE auto completion for. Um, so how do the questions look like? Well, each item has three parts. There's a scenario, there's a stem, and there are the answers, the options. The scenario is one or two sentences. It contains the information required to choose the correct answer. The question is one sentence, and then we have the options, which are multiple choice answers. And uh, there are three possible answer keys, one out of four, two out of four, or three out of five. And if more than one answer has to be selected, the stem states very clearly how many, right? Which three actions do you take? Choose three. So there's always this double prompting. If you don't see that, it's only one answer. So it's hard to miss. <coughs> For question with multiple answers, you have to get all of them right. It's not like, okay, two, I got two out of three right, so that's maybe 66% of an answer, right? <laughs> it, you have to get it all or nothing. <coughs> there are no trick questions, or at least the authors and the reviewers didn't think it was a trick question. It's in the eye of the beholder, I guess, but that's the idea. There are no none of the above or all of the above answers or questions like which of the following are true or false and no double negatives, right? We try to make them really, yeah, good questions, basically, right? That really test important knowledge. The actions, the questions are supposed to be actionable. So you'll see things like, how do you fix this issue? Or which actions do you take? Or maybe, like, what is the effect of this? So it's about, you know, real effects. So let's talk about an example question. This is a question I wrote for this talk. It's not in the exam, but mm, you'll see some similar things maybe. From a difficulty level, this might be more the professional exam. There are different exam levels. If you're interested in the difference, uh, you can come to me. But it's pretty well known out there if, you're, uh, you, know, if you want to research this. Um, when I write questions, I try to write questions about things that I want to ask people I would maybe hire. Right? I'm interested in evaluating a developer. Uh, how does he write Magento code? So I try to frame these questions that actually are more general development questions in the Magento context. So um, some people say I, I tend to write more hard questions, but again, I guess that's in the eye of the beholder. So I'll read the question. This is a two-slide question. This is the stem, and the next slide has the options. And, um, and then you can pick your own answer in your mind, and you don't have to tell it to anybody, and then we'll discuss each of the options. So for example, you are working on an extension uh, for an extension vendor who protects their intellectual property by validating licenses against a license server. That's a valid use case, right? Customers are complaining that running any bin magenta command is very slow after installing one of the company's extensions. Okay, we all make mistakes, right? So this extension adds a command to bin magento. While investigating, you discover the following code in the command class. And there's a constructor that takes a license. We don't know the type. And it sets a Boolean property is license valid, and that's the result of the validation license method call, validate license call. So here's the constructor again, and the stem is, how do you resolve the issue? So I'll read the options and then talk about each one. A, implement local license validation instead over the internet. B, move the validation license call into the execute method. Or C, Check the license at random samples instead of every time. Remember, this is in a bin magento command, right? Or D, cache the validation result in the magento config cache. So, take your pick. Again, it's just for you. Doesn't matter if you're right or wrong. So, option A, implement local license validation instead of over the internet. Would that be valid? Yeah, it could work. Might be faster. 
Maybe the network request is the overhead, maybe not. We don't really know. So it depends, right? Maybe if there's a lot of decryption happening, maybe it's still slow. So it's not solving the real problem. It's just moving, moving it around a bit. Option B, move the validate license call into the execute method. Now that's an interesting option, right? Because it doesn't seem very clear why that might actually have an impact, but given there's a bit of code that's a constructor, maybe that's not a bad choice. And it actually is, in fact, so that bin Magento um, is built on Symphony console command, Symphony command console component, so which uh, instantiates every single command class when it's run every time. So that actually kind of makes sense here. Every time this class is instantiated, it does a license check. Hmm. So that probably is more at the root of the cause where we can actually influence it. We can't change how the Symfony command infrastructure is built, so maybe that's the right answer. Option C, check the license at random samples instead of every time. Well, again, that's more fixing the customer's experience, maybe, you know, maybe then every third run is slow, so it's not a real fix. Also, it doesn't satisfy the business requirements of validating the license on every time the, the code is used, right? Um, and option D, caching, that's a very popular thing in Magento. Uh, it doesn't really fix, the, it's, it's Band-Aid, right? We are just introducing other issues. It might be first, uh, be fast, but at the same time, we introduce issues like, well, what if the license expired, but we still have a positive lookup in the cache, right? People could continue to use it. Or what happens when the cache is flushed? So again, not a good option. And indeed, the answer is B. Move the validated license call into the execute method. Now you might ask, why is this question in here? It just test your knowledge about, uh, you know, how does some symphony stuff work? Isn't this a Magento exam? But actually, in the Magento technical guidelines, we can find this point here. Class constructors can have only dependency assignment operations and or argument validation operations. No other operations are allowed, and that's just one use case where that actually has an impact. Right. So these technical guidelines are actually quite helpful and useful. They're only for the internal Magento team, how they write the Magento code, but I think they're quite, they gave me quite a bit of insight how to work with the platform. Um, so here's a little excerpt about part of it. So there are things like, there should be no circular dependencies between objects, or all modular DI settings except the presentation layer and configuration should be stored in module DI etc DI XML. What's missing here is the explanation. Why? Like, why must app etc DI XML only contain framework level dependency injection settings? So uh, reading the technical guidelines and asking yourself why, trying to figure it out, I think that's a great way to learn and prep. Asking why is the best question ever. So back to the exam questions. Some questions have qualifiers. What are qualifiers? Qualifiers are part of the stem. So the question, and it looks something like keeping simplicity in mind or keeping maintainability in mind, right, to get the idea. So normally, Many people just see them as noise. Of course, we always want to write simple and maintainable and compatible code, right? But they actually have a purpose, these qualifiers. They're trying to guide us to the correct answer. Because Magento is very flexible, and almost always I find there are many ways to implement a given solution. We have to make decisions how to implement something. Do we decouple it or not? Right, Karen? So, for these questions with qualifiers, like in this example, many of the answers might technically work. So how do we choose the right one? And that's where the qualifier comes into play. So do we use a preference or a type argument configuration or a plugin, right? Oftentimes, we have a choice. And depending on the circumstances, each of those approaches could be valid. So there, to me, the term best practice only makes sense in a given context. There is no global best practice. That's just people wanting an easy answer. We have to think and apply. So often it's a trade-off. It's faster development versus better maintainability or upgradability versus more performant code, right? And we have to make those choices. There are many factors influ influencing how we code our solutions, like lifetime of a project, budget, skill level, security, all these things. 
the qualifiers then tell us which answer to choose. And that's something that I'm interested in, in when, when I'm hiring a developer. Right? I want to know how does he solve problems given a certain set of constraints. So if you see a qualifier mentioning maintainability, that probably rules out any of the options where code is copied. Right? Because copying code, upgrade something, well, that's additional work. So favor answers that make changes and upgrades easier. If the qualifier is about compatibility, well, that rules out the options that are more likely to cause extension conflicts. If you see simplicity, favor expressive options with less code, less elements. Testability or reusability, favor answer that allows you to replace collaborators with test doubles or other classes. You get the idea. So let's have a look at another example question. This would be more associate exam uh, level, for example. Again, it's a new question. It's not in the exam. And um, it's got a qualifier in there. It all fits on one slide this time. You need to customize the Magento Checkout JS Proceed to Checkout JavaScript module. How do you do that? Keeping compatibility in mind. A. Add a path override configuration to the required JS config JS. B. Add a global map alias override to the required JS config JS. C. Copy the file, proceed to checkout JS to the folder Magento checkout of the active front end theme. Or D. Add a JavaScript mixin to the required JS config JS. Again, if you want to, you can pick your choice. And so keeping compatibility in mind, what about option A? Well, the path settings are, are global. It's easy to create a conflict. It's like a preference on the PHP side. So probably that's not the answer, even though technically it would work. What about B? B allows us to re reduce the scope of a rewrite of a module, but it says global map alias, right? So we want to affect that globally. So again, same limitation as option A, probably not the right answer. What about option C? That's, that's like a theme, le theme level customization. But files also are global state. So in this case, it doesn't mention maintainability or upgradability. But still, if a different extension or customization required you to do the same thing, copy it over, it would be a conflict. D is the only option that allows multiple extensions to customize the same bit of code on functionality. So yeah, D is the answer. Right? You get the idea. All right. So when you're getting ready, when you're preparing, a couple of hints. The study guide of Magento, it's, it's very lean. There's not too much in there. <laughs> um, it basically tells you what are the objectives on the exam blueprint, so you know what to look at. Right? There's also the Swift Auto Study Guide. They're great. Joseph Maxwell did a wonderful job there. They're free. They're based on the official guides, but there's a lot more in there. Um, I think most people know them and, and use them to, to prepare. The official technical developer guidelines, I think they're really good. Um, go ahead, look at them. They're good to prepare, not necessarily good. I don't apply all of them during the code that I write, but it's good for me to understand how they work and why they're there. So get a good understanding for that. And finally, I just wanted to tell you, in the guidelines, there are they mention patterns and, and principles and stuff like solid, and factory and builder and so on. But please don't go ahead and just memorize those patterns. Uh, I think that actually does more harm than good. Um, it should be the other way around. It's better to start from first principles. So what is a source code dependency? And I'm, I'm not talking about composer dependencies of packages here. What I'm talking about is if class A calls a method on class B, that the dependency if class B is gone, class A breaks. That's the source code dependency. So what are the consequences of that dependency? And how do certain changes impact that dependency? Right? And starting from those, that leads to a much deeper understanding of the principles behind the labels like solid or law of Demeter and so on. Right? So it's much more useful and we can simply apply common sense and we end up with those principles and patterns anyway. So all stuff like Liskov substitution principle, how interfaces play a role in that, uh, coupling and cohesion, right? We, we can arrive at the same conclusions on our own. 
If you have time, familiarize yourself with the four rules of simple design. I've uh, recommended those on this stage before, but I think they're still not appreciated enough. They're really great. First rule is, does my code pass all tests? It doesn't say automated or manual test. It means it just has to work. Otherwise, it's worthless code, right? The other rule is, does it express intent? Can I look at it code? Can another developer look at the code and grasp its meaning easily? And thirdly, is there no duplication? Two and three, they kind of contradict each other. Optimizing one usually leads to the other. So we have to find a balance. And finally, fewest possible elements. If I can do something with two classes instead of 12, maybe that's the simplest solution, right? And I find them very valuable. I use them quite often when I'm writing code and I have to make decisions how to implement a solution. When a question has a qualifier, keeping simplicity in mind, you might want to apply those. Before I wrap up, some things about smart guessing because none of us worked, have probably worked in every part of Magento. So if you see a question and you really just don't know what to do, well, first of all, of course, eliminate maybe some of the options. So you only have to guess out of three or maybe out of two. The next thing would be maybe one of the options looks like it took more work to write. That could be a hint that that's the correct answer, right? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it's true. And uh, another hint is, if you really have no idea, but you have like this gut feeling, trust it. Don't second guess yourself and don't change your mind afterwards. There are uh, studies that show if the first answer you pick is probably the right one and changing your mind later, if you're not sure, probably makes it wrong. So you're more likely to get that question correct just by sticking with the first choice. And finally, if you really have no idea what to pick, just always pick the same one, like always A or A and B, whatever, <laughs> because the answers are randomized anyway, anyway, and again, studies have shown the question is more likely to be correct, correct if you always pick the same one. All right. And finally, go check out Mage2TV. It's a great resource, uh, subscription service, and I just had to put this in there anyway. All right, that's it. So thank you very much. I think we're probably out of time. What? Hey, awesome. Very good. Any questions? Oh, some. Oh, um, the four rules of simple design. It's not a book, but there is a book. I just recently found it. It's called. It's by Corey Haynes, actually. I forget the name. It's a very short book. And he's the one who invented these code camps, so where people get together and write code cards for one day, always focusing on a different aspect of the four rules. I've never attended one, but it, I would like to. Um, it's, uh, damn, can somebody just Google it? I don't want to do it on stage. Corey Haynes, Four Rules of Simple Design. I'm sure you'll find the book. It's got this uh, kind of yellowish color on the front end, uh, on the cover. The front end, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Again, it's really a quick read. It's, it's kind of nice. There's uh, there's a lot of information. They're also on the Bleaky from Martin Fowler. Yeah. Anyway, other question? Yep. Uh, hello. Okay. Uh, maybe it's not a question. It's uh, just pointing out that uh, there are some questions about, uh, for example, price calculation. I want to just point out everyone who wants to uh, pass uh, Magento to certification that just to check out uh, before getting on exam uh, how the prices are calculated in uh, when it comes to having multiple rules, like uh, catalog rule and uh, then coupon code and then uh, having different uh, rules for shipping, uh, just uh, check it before going to the exam. It's, it's quite important and uh, there are several questions related to that. Yep, that's right. It's also on the exam blueprint. Uh, price calculation is part of it. So, for the professional exam, I believe, yeah. Yeah, yeah that's right. Mm -hmm. And, um, yeah. But, and also, it's kind of useful to know that stuff, too. So, true. Fino, yeah. the book is called Understanding the Four Rules of Simple Design. Ah, thank you. Understanding the Four Rules of the Corey Haynes book, right? Okay, I really just don't remember the title, interestingly enough. Yeah. Very good. Okay. 
So I think that's it. Thank you very much. Enjoy the day.